Yeah, um, my name is Nathan Tyson. You can just call me Nate. Um, I have a couple uh, students from my own youth group, Lydia, Lydia and Naomi. <laughs> Um, they're in our, uh, in our high school ministry uh, called Royals, and um, I'm going to embarrass them just a little bit, hype them up a little bit, and just say that uh, in our youth group, we called each other Ding Dongs. Somehow that, that was a thing, and so I've, I've gone to watch them grow from uh, Ding Dongs to Ding Dongs who love Jesus so much. It's been an incredible to watch the work of God take place in their life, and they're now... Uh, they, they're now like the mom and aunt of the youth group now, and they love and protect them, and they take care of them. They're still trying to communicate with them, and um, a bunch of them uh, uh, wanted to be here with us today. And um, In fact, I was able to bring a few of my uh, kids from the youth group. They were able to ditch school today. Uh, so <laughs> Called it a college tour. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the Jazz back there, uh, Tommy and Ethan, and so they're here uh, with us, and, and they're also praying about being CBI students. So if uh, pray, you know, talk to them, talk to them, share your experiences with them if you if you get the opportunity, if you get the chance to. So um, I'm excited to be here uh, with a bunch of. Lydia's and Naomi's who love God, who have the, the potential, right, for use in the ministry. Um, does anyone here feel called to, like, worship leading? How about, like, being a pastor, like a youth pastor? Any other youth pastors? Yeah, cool. Uh, missionaries? How about just whatever God wants? Sir, right? Yeah, that's like all of us, yeah. Yeah, that's us, yeah. That's exciting. Uh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, I was in Bible college too, and I remember feeling that like call like to ministry. But I just love the Lord and His Word, and just digging into it. And um, you know, the best thing that I could think of is just don't miss out on what God is wanting to do here, uh, because you're so focused on what God is wanting to do in the future. You know, take every opportunity you can right now. Soak everything in. God has called you to be a student right now. Matthew twenty five twenty three says, uh, is my, like, I remember being in Bible college thinking, like, this is kind of like my motivation to uh, what I want to hear God say when I graduate. Uh, Matthew 25, 23, I'll put it up on the screen. Um, it says, uh, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Um, I'm actually, if you're switching, turning your Bibles, turn over to Leviticus chapter 23. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I've got a thing for Leviticus. Uh, I flippin' love that book. It's, it's a book where at surface level could be pretty boring, but the more you dig into it, the more gold you find. And the gold in it is incredible, uh, but we'll later be in Leviticus 23. Yeah. Uh, but in Matthew 25, what I wanted to hear when I was in Bible college, when I finished graduating, was, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And so be a faithful student. Focus on what God has given to you now and today. And enjoy it. It's going to be one of the best times of your life. And if you're faithful in this today, God can entrust even more to you. And so be faithful with the work that you do have and studying his word, soak it all in. So I was asked to share two things today. Uh, one was just my testimony. And the second uh, is an actual teaching that I'm so excited to, uh, to share with you guys. Uh, but before I, I do that and share a bit of my testimony and message, uh, let's pray. Yeah. Well, before, be, yeah. You know, before you move on. Yeah. I'm not gonna let this go. Let's go. Let's go. What's up with Leviticus 23? Leviticus 23. Yeah. We got all the holiday. Oh, we're going to get there. Gonna we're going to get there. Oh, gonna we are going to get, get right. trust me. Trust me. You're going to be wanting to get out of Leviticus 23 by the oh, by the no, end. I'm in no, I'm just kidding. I'm in Leviticus <laughs> Let's pray. Let's pray, guys. God, we just come before you, Lord. We thank you so much for uh, uh, our opportunity to be here to to be in your word, God. I pray that you would help uh, the students, Lord. I know what it's like in an afternoon after lunch. It's easy to start to crash out, but God, I pray that you would uh, renew us, Lord, to just be able to focus in on your word, Lord, and 
and what you want us to hear today, Lord. Uh, maybe even just encouragement from, from this testimony. And so, Lord, I pray that you would use it, Lord. Use the, th- the things uh, I went through, Lord, to maybe bless and help somebody too, Lord. And so, God, we just want to bring this time up to you, God. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Church. Church. Okay. For uh, my testimony, I'm going to just share like a resume, big overview, and then we'll narrow down into it. I'll, I'll just share the resume version of my testimony, and then I'll share like what's real. So resume first, then I'll share what's real. The resume version, I graduated from uh, Calvary Chapel Bible College. Um, I interned at Calvary Chapel Corona for a few years. After I graduated Calvary Chapel Bible College, um, I, um, I started and directed a affiliate Bible college that is similar to, uh, or like uh, here uh, in my hometown for about five years. Uh, so I got to do a lot of what it was fun watching David uh, literally do the exact same thing that I've been doing for a while. And uh, God bless him with all the work. Make sure you thank him for all that he does. He's doing a lot for the school. Um, but I started and directed an affiliate Bible college in my hometown for about five years. Um, I took over the high school ministry at Calvary Chapel Corona um, after that. And I've been the youth pastor, the high school pastor for seven years. Um, I'm also an assistant pastor to my senior pastor, which basically means I just help other ministries out and uh, teach whenever I'm asked to. My biggest accomplishment so far is being a husband and a dad. Um, I've been married now for six years to uh, another, uh, these are two amazing anointed worship leaders, by the way. Um, I'm married to another amazing worship leader. Uh, Her name's Megan, and I have three boys. Nehemiah, Judah, and number three is showing up in December and in January. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so that's the resume. Uh, but uh, let me share with you what's real because I think it's easy to think other people's lives are better than yours because you compare your, uh, their highlights to your behind the scenes. And um, what's real is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, tr- how about turn your Bibles to now to 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Psych. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. So um, for my testimony, I'll share with you the behind the scenes uh, that happened in my life that led from um, being someone uh, very far from God to uh, being a high school pastor, which I never would have thought happening, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and so if we're looking at behind the scenes, uh, then we're telling a story, and if I had to give a, a title to the story uh, that's happened in my life is New Beginnings, uh, God has given me uh, New Beginnings, uh, I hope you remember this, New Beginnings, because I'm going to connect that with the teaching part later on, and I will be... Uh, um, so yeah, uh, actually look at verse nine. Uh, this would be probably the theme <laughs> of this story in my life. Verse nine, it says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities than the power of Christ, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Uh, this is the, the theme in my life because all of my life, uh, I was never good enough in my own strength and often messed up a lot because of, uh, of a false image that I had. Uh, because of his grace, he gave me new beginnings. Uh, so I guess in like the back of the book, I, I'd, I'd say like I failed so much and was so often not good enough, but God loved me and gave me grace and I had a new beginning. And where... I failed, God succeeded. Where I wasn't good enough, God was. Uh, And so I'm going to share, just as a disclaimer, um, I am in no way going to be looking for your pity or for you to feel bad for me uh, because I'm thankful for it now because um, I'm not great, but God is. And because I'm weak, he is strong. Uh, So just remember that uh, because I'm going to expose what a ding-dong I am (laughs) or I was. So, um, uh, so I grew up in a Christian family, uh, but I never gave my life to God till after high school. 
However, I knew how to act Christian at church. In my family, uh, we had a really cool cousin, uh, older cousin, and he played football, and girls loved him. And so looking up to my uh, older cousin, I wanted, I wanted to be like him. And literally from like early childhood, like being a toddler through high school, like he was like my role model. And I wanted to be like him, so I wanted to play football. And, but my parents wouldn't let me because, believe it or not, I was very skinny. <laughs> and uh, I, um, and so anytime I wanted to play a sport, uh, my parents or people would just say, like, I would break if I played a sport. <laughs> so, you know, that wasn't cool. Uh, so, and it didn't give me the attention I wanted. So I, I would just eventually kind of just give up on sports. And I want, but I still wanted to be like cool and fit in. I wanted to be like my older cousin. And, um, I thought that was like what life was about. And so I tried to fit in with a cooler crowd. And so I became someone that I wasn't. Uh, I was always trying to keep up with trends. Uh, uh, and then as I got into high school, I used to like build relationships with people uh, to try to like almost like like use these friend groups to get to another friend group, to get to another friend group. And I would do uh, things like that. I'd carry drugs with me and uh, ditch class. I would do anything for, for attention. I really was becoming someone that I wasn't. Uh, and I tried to keep up this image that like I'm this big partier person. And I made myself seem like a bigger personality than I was. And I, and I wasn't. And like to, to give an example of that, in high school, uh, in junior high, I had an extreme, extreme fear of public speaking. Uh, like, I was so afraid of it that I would, um, <laughs> I would, like, run to the bathroom. Not, like, run, like, oh, like, scared. Like, I would, like, like act like I'm ditching class. Like, cool, you know, cool guy standing up in the middle of class. Like, I don't want, I don't want any part of this. I'd get up and walk out of the classroom, and uh, I'd ditch uh, class. Because I was just so afraid. And I think what it was was that I was so afraid of people figuring out who I was, you know, that people would be like, you know, I would expose myself for the, the, the loser that I really am. And uh, I'd get exposed and I, I wouldn't be able to handle that reality. So I just ran from it. And sometimes I would just not even show up to school. I would just act sick. And so because of that, I would take a failing grade. And um, I would... Uh, just lie um, to try to keep up this image. So I was not the cool guy. Uh, I wanted people to think I was, and some people, you know, I tricked into thinking I was, but the, the people I wanted to be close with, never that never happened, and most of my life was just a lie to myself and other people. Um, and because I focused so much on what people thought of me, my entire school year was full of terrible grades. Uh, teachers struggled with me. They questioned my mom if I was even related to my sister because my sister from kindergarten to college never got anything less than an A. And so they would like question like, are, they, are you sure they're related? Uh, and uh, we just all assumed my family, <laughs> we just all assumed myself included, I just thought I was dumb. And uh, um, But I think I was just so dedicated to having my peers like me uh, and it wasn't working, and it caused me to fail at school, in junior high and high school, um, to get people to like me. You know, I would try to get girls to like me, and I, I would do so much to fix myself. And I haven't shared this since high school, but I'll share with you just how terrible this all is. Um, even in high school, I would, like, wear makeup uh, at times um, because I felt ugly, and I felt like, and if I felt so ugly, I would just skip school. Um, I just had this appearance that wasn't working that I just felt like I had to live up to. Um, I had this fake identity. And, I, and so I learned how to be very manipulative. And so I would have lots of girlfriends and sometimes multiple at the same time. And um, that worked for a while. And guys, you know, for the short period of time, they're like, oh, you're such a pimp, you know. And, you know, uh, they, would, they would, you know, uh, say stuff like that. And I'd boost my ego a little bit. Uh, but it didn't take too long until girls started to realize that and lost that, like, popularity 
feeling. And so I had to, again, face that reality that I'm not who I'm trying to be, um, that my life is a lie, and, and that I'm trying to uh, maintain this appearance of someone that I was not. Uh, then there was drums. <laughs> I learned how to play the drums in high school uh, when emo and screamo music was really popular. <laughs> and, uh, and I actually got pretty good at it. Uh, people were starting to know me about drums and tell me positive things for the first time in my life that was based on something on my own actual natural ability, something that wasn't generated, something that wasn't fake. Something, you know, it was based on my own ability, and it felt amazing. Uh, I was winning drum competitions. People were, you know, uh, patting me on the back for it. I thought this was my ticket for people to love me, and plus, girls like drummers, right? And, um, and you know, I got good enough to where I was able to play at, uh, at different bars, and one of them was a Whiskey A Go-Go, which is a, a famous live music venue, and... Uh, and so people were telling me I have a career in it, but then my parents, being believers, and saw me like succeeding in this and craving and chasing after this like praise from people, they made me quit everything, uh, which was good in the long run, but it made me feel like the one thing that I did have in life was taken away from me. So eventually the truth would win out and I had to face the reality that I'm not good enough, I'm not cool enough, that the lie that I, I think I need um, I, I am only failing at it, or I can't have it, that people don't think uh, <laughs> I'm this person, and they don't love me. I'm a failure at school and everything that I do. So I battled with depression because of that. And uh, the problem was I couldn't admit that I wasn't good enough. Like, I had a, I, I couldn't get a hold of that. And because I was trying to be someone I was not, instead of admitting it, I decided um, I'm going to think about my career, and I chose yeah, I'm going to be a firefighter, and which caused me to have some decent grades my senior year and make up for my failed classes, which blew my parents' mind because I was actually starting to do good in school, and they're like, "Hey, you're actually capable. <laughs> you actually know, you know, you actually know how to be a pretty good student." And um, but then looking back, I'm like, I don't know if you can tell why I wanted to be a firefighter because being a firefighter is cool. People love them. Girls love them. And so it was like, I just put it on to something else. Again, I could not accept that identity. And I, I was just like, okay, I'm not that right now, but I will be that person later. And so uh, I barely graduate high school. Uh, and then God steps in. <laughs> uh, the next day, my dad loses his job, which puts a hold on me on being able to go to college and be a firefighter. Uh, and I got this like terrible warehouse job. Uh, even worked at Walmart and Jack in the Box, too, um, to try to alleviate some of the financial burden on my family. And then my world completely flips upside down uh, in the best way possible. You know, Romans uh, 8.28, uh, it says, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and uh, for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Well, that means that for things to be worked together for the good, that means that there needs to be some hard times that take place too. And so my life gets flipped upside down. And in these hard times, God does something amazing, but I don't wish on anybody at all. I'm thankful for it though. And God turns something terrible into something amazing. And so God taught me three life-changing uh, things in this time. Uh, it all started when my mom found out that my when my dad lost his job, she also found out that he'd been cheating on him. And uh, so I never have seen my mom so, so broken. Uh, I never heard her cries, cry the cries she cried or say the words that she spoke. Uh, and as my dad quickly begged for forgiveness, my mom couldn't even like stand to look at him or hear him, which created a huge change that never happened in my life. It felt like I had to step in to a role um, to do whatever it takes to keep my family together. Uh, that life needs to not be about me, uh, and I need to focus on my family. And so the first thing God teaches me is that life isn't about me. And even though I wanted to punch my dad in the face, uh, I knew that he was showing that he was sorry 
and I didn't want my family to be split. And my mom would look uh, to me uh, for once. You know, normally as a child, right, I'm, I'm looking to my mom, and she's now looking to me. And I knew I needed God's help to help my mom. And as she looked to me broken and hurt for, for comfort and what to do, um, God put me in this spot, and which was the next major change that happened in my life, was me not looking toward my own ability anymore, but was now looking towards God's ability. And so the second thing that God taught me through this is that God is able to do what I'm not. And so I started praying with my mom reading the Bible with her, listening to sermons with her, and I saw how that would help her and at first, just to even be able to like look at my dad in the very beginning. And I kept pointing her to God, sending her verses and uh, reaching out to pastors even for advice on things, what to say, and she eventually would be strong enough to talk to my dad a little longer and give him some chance to repent. And there were still hard days where like I had a run out in the middle of the street in the middle of the night uh, trying to find my mom because she just couldn't take it anymore. She was hurt so so bad, and she'd run, and my dad would bang on my door and say, your mom's gone again. And I'd uh, get up and run down the streets trying to find her, and when I would find her, she would just tell me, like, she can't do it anymore. And, uh, and so uh, I would pray with her, and she would come back home. And so I firsthand saw the powerful work of God take place. Uh, Over months, I saw God transform real pain to a new beginning. And while my parents' marriage was having a new beginning, uh, my life was also starting to have a new beginning. I saw the power of God take place in my family. I experienced also in this hard time a sense of freedom from my own image, Uh, that I've had my whole childhood. Um, And God used me as an instrument for his power. Like, uh, you know, failure, mess up me, was being used by God to do something good. Uh, And so I I wanted more of that. Uh, And and as my family was on a path to, to restoration, God had one more thing he wanted to teach me. Uh, The first was life wasn't about me. The second was God is able to do what I can't. Uh, The third lesson that God taught me uh, took place when my dad, during the restoration of my family, um, he became like this fired up believer uh, during this time. And one day he asked me if I'd go with him on a missions trip to Honduras, which is, uh, which interestingly is uh, Lydia's family, um, her, what is it, your your aunt, your, her aunt runs a, uh, a missions um, group, or Charlie, Charlie's Lunch is, is the group, and so we went there, and, and that's where um, um, God really showed me something crazy. So I went with my dad, and, and went to, we went to some of the poorest areas in that, in there, and you know people living under aluminum roofs, and people eating out of the trash, you name it, just eye-opening things, but that wasn't even the biggest eye-opening thing when I was there. The biggest was when I was attending a church service where almost the whole village uh, was attending. And the crazy thing was it was raining and everyone is like, like this whole village, all these people are like running under this aluminum roof, which it's, when it's raining in Honduras, it's also thunder lightning. So it's like, dude, this is, we're going to die, you know? And (laughs) <laughs> and so um, I'm seeing all these people uh, just cluttering into like under this aluminum roof for a church service and some people going underneath like these huge trees with these big huge uh, branches and they're hot, hiding under it seeking shelter and so while I'm trying to figure out like how to get out of the rain uh, I notice that these people seem to be completely unaffected by it and then I saw something that, that completely shook me. Uh, I saw by far the happiest people I had ever seen in my entire life. They were so incredibly happy. 
And over there, you know, they're just trying to live. They weren't trying to be cool. They weren't trying to even really be like successful or seeking praise or they weren't even seeking shelter sometimes for the rain. They were just standing out there. Uh, but they were so happy. I guess the better word would be joyful. They were so joyful. And I just remember being mind blown, seeing all the smiles of just genuinely joyful people, like just so much joy. It, it blew my mind to see. And I remember thinking, like, I came here to give them things. Like, we'd go down there with doctors, and we'd bring medical supplies, and we'd bring flip-flops and candy and toys for the kids. Like, we came to give them stuff, but they had something that I wanted. You know, they had joy, and I wondered why. But growing up in a Christian home, it didn't take, like, too long to realize that all they have is Jesus, uh, and Christ was sufficient. And when I got home, I dedicated uh, time to the, to the Lord to soak in all that God had been showing me. And uh, I somehow ended up reading the book of Ecclesiastes, a perfect book for me to have read. I don't know how I ended up there, but I ended up there, which is a book that is about how all the things in this world is meaningless. It's like chasing the wind when it's without God. That the only thing that has meaning is, is when you do it for God. And so I was chasing the wind. I was chasing the wind. I was, I was seeking love and attention from other people. And I was trying to be someone that I, I was not, which taught me that third major lesson in life, that all I need is Jesus and my identity can be found in him. That I don't need to be great. I don't need to be liked. I don't need attention but God is great, and he wants me, and he just wants those that are willing. And I found freedom in God's grace, and I found freedom in losing myself. And while the world teaches us love yourself, you know, treat yourself, uh, the party life, you know, um, brings happiness, that you're happy when you're accepted, uh, God says give up yourself and your attempts that in him is the fountains of living water, like it says in John 4. So when I finished reading Ecclesiastes, I felt God say, like, I'll let you be a firefighter, but they're probably going to die, you know, the next day or a week from now or a month from now. Or you can follow me and save souls from the fires of hell. And so I, de I dedicated my life to him. Uh, and later on that night before going to bed, I, I wrote in a journal, which, by the way, the journal that I kept, especially in Bible college, has helped me so much. So just side note, like, you sh it's not scripture, not, a, not, not, the, not the 11th commandment, but strong suggestion. It would be a good idea to uh, keep a journal of, like, what God's doing in your life right now because you are going to, you'll love it. You'll, you'll high-five yourself later for it. So anyways, uh, later on that night, I, I, before going to bed, I wrote in a journal, and I said, God, I want to be used by you. Maybe you guys have did something like this maybe before coming here. And I said, God, I want to be used by you. Uh, what do you want me to do? Uh, I'll do it. And uh, I went to sleep, and I had a dream <laughs> that Megan, who we weren't even dating yet, in the dream, she stands up from a couch and just points at me and says, you're Nate, you will be a pastor. <laughs> and I... I remember waking up, totally forgot about it, and then, you know, I took a shower, was getting ready to go to church, and uh, looked in the mirror, and then all of a sudden, I like, I, like, remember that dream, and it actually felt like, you know, the Holy Spirit had come upon me, like, in Acts chapter 2, like, just the Spirit felt like it hit me, like, you have a call, God's now calling. I said, I'm willing, like, you know, like Isaiah, like, here, Lord, send me. You know, and I felt like that was that moment. It was like, and God said, okay, <laughs> no take back, no erases. <laughs> you know, it's, this is happening now. <laughs> and so I told my parents about it. And remember, all this change in my life is happening like quick, really quick. Megan, just, when she tells other people about it, she's like, Nate changed like literally overnight. The person that I was was a completely different person. And so when I told my parents this, I said, hey, guys, I'm going to be a pastor uh, I feel like God's calling me to be a pastor. They're like, uh-huh. 
uh-huh, yeah. And I think most people were just, when I would say something like that, literally just expecting me to just like change and be back to like this crazy party image kid, you know, wannabe, but I failed at it, but I was tricking some of the people. Um, but I, I turned into like this, who I really was. I'm quiet, I'm shy, I'm, uh, but I'm committed to Jesus and what he wants me to do. I was who I really was in Christ, but people didn't know who I really was. People just knew this fake Nate. That's all they knew. And this change also just happens overnight to where now I'm like quiet. I'm reading the word. Like, you know, I'm sitting like front row in my, uh, in the church service and raising my hand, you know, like just asking questions, uh, talking to my pastor and uh, him spending time with me and answering questions and, and stuff. And so I just completely changed. But uh, my parents, when I told them the call, they were like, okay, you know, expecting me to be, to say like, sorry, I'm just kidding, you know, and do something crazy with my life instead. But no, I really was changed. And God had three lessons for me before entering into that call of ministry that I'd want to share with you guys. Um, uh, so I thought when I shared my call that I would get a lot of support from that, that people would be excited, like, yeah, that's awesome. Um, but my parents questioned it. Uh, even a couple of my pastors questioned it. Uh, they actually discouraged me from it. They actually said, like, that I shouldn't. <laughs> and the sad thing was that even one of them, uh, after discouraging me from it, actually started investing into this other guy, uh, one of my friends, uh, and said, like, he's called to ministry. And uh, so that was awesome. <laughs> uh, but it was my first lesson uh, to follow God's call, not people's judgment. To follow his call, not people's judgment. And, and so people knew old crazy Nate, uh, not who I really was. Uh, but, at the, uh, but at the time, I just thought of Mark 6, 4, where Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives and his own house. So I was excited to go to Bible college. I was excited to grow in my call. I was excited to build relationships. I was excited to be surrounded by supportive people. I would have loved being with you guys. Uh, however, uh, first semester, I found out that everyone in my dorm already had their friends, and uh, I was outcasted, like, again. And even though I wasn't living for myself anymore or trying to maintain this fake identity, I was still discouraged because I was now just being me in Christ. Uh, but I noticed a lot of the, the loud, the big personalities uh, of the school, getting the teaching, the discipleship oppor opportunities, the, um, they were getting everything, you know, the internship opportunities. And I was tempted to put on this fake personality again and be someone that I was not. And maybe that could be someone here too. And, but God reminded me uh, and kept me from making that same mistake and maybe... Uh, Lord's trying to protect you from it too. Uh, and by the way, I am in no way at all saying anything negative to my school uh, at all because God only did great things for me there. God did amazing things. He reached me in amazing ways and did amazing things there. It's just really easy for church leaders to see the potential in someone that has a really big like personality and that stand out. And so it's risky. And I know this. Now, being a church leader myself, it is risky to raise up someone that's shy and quiet to do a big personality type job, you know, where you're out there and you're greeting people and loving people. It, it's a risky thing. And so my personality was not a standout, and my personality still isn't a standout personality. So I just got left out. That just kind of like the theme in my life. So for me, but remember, like, don't feel bad. If you feel bad, don't. So for me, I, uh, I had to learn my second lesson before entering in, into ministry, which was not to compare myself with other people and what God was doing in other people's life. And so, uh, you know, great thing for here. Like, you guys are all going to do, like, God's got a call on your life for something different, you know? And so you don't need to be comparing, like, who's got the internship here or who's doing what or who's teaching this or whatever. God is doing a work in your life, just focus in on the work God's doing on your life. Comparison is so dangerous. Uh, it's one of the worst sins. It was Satan's, right? It was Satan's first sin. Isaiah 14, 14. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And it was mankind's first sin comparison. In Genesis 3, 5, he said, for God knows that in that day you will, 
eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Comparison is a deadly sin, especially in ministry. You know, preachers with big churches, they preach like this. Famous worship leaders dress like this. Church leaders, you know, church, you know, people in the church, they act like this, you know, and we can compare. And it's it's dangerous. So I've just learned the hard way to just follow the, the, the two C's, Christ and the call God has given to me. Um, because the third C, Christians, could be a good example, maybe a good example, but sometimes can steer you the wrong way and it's dangerous. So I just studied the word uh, hard to prepare for the call that God had on my life. Uh, despite of what was going on around me, even feeling sometimes like, man, is this even real? <laughs> you know, is, this, is God really gonna, is God really going to use me? You know, am, am, I, am I just gonna graduate after this and then be like, oh, I don't know what to do after this? Uh, and everyone else is gonna get the opportunities. Like, is that what's gonna happen again? And, and so um, I just stayed focused on, on the word. You know, God just kept me close to him. And once I graduated, I had no idea what to do, (laughs) Uh, whether to apply or look for jobs. Uh, So since I didn't know what to do about my specific call, I did the general call we all have, which is Mark 16, uh, verse 15. It says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So I started with my neighbors at home, uh, and I started just preaching the gospel door to door, just going to each one of my neighbors just preaching the gospel. Uh, and then out of nowhere, I get a call from uh, my pastor from my own home church. And he said, hey, you want to go to Chili's with me? Never miss an opportunity to go to Chili's with your pastor, you know? <laughs> Life lesson number no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but no, I got uh, there at Chili's. Uh, I got hired to be a pastoral intern uh, at, our, at my church. And, uh, but I still had a third thing that God really wanted to show, share with me or teach me uh, a lesson in ministry. And so, um, so when I started the Bible college, people said I needed more experience. Uh, when I started teaching for the Bible college, they were saying that um, I was too young to teach. And when I took over the high school ministry, I had parents who didn't want to bring their kids because they thought I was still some crazy kid. Because remember, this is the same church now. They just saw all of a sudden, crazy kid, quick change, Bible college, he's gone for a while, and then he's back, now he's taking over high school. Like, what the heck's going on? So some of the parents were like, I know that kid. <laughs> no, keep him far from that youth group, you know? And uh, so I even had parents who didn't want to bring their kids because of that. And uh, when I became a pastor, you know, I didn't receive the opportunities I thought would happen when I became a pastor. I thought, like, I become a pastor, and, like, magically things just change in my life, and things just, like, all my problems go away. <laughs> and uh, none of that happened. Uh, so my third l- lesson, I'm still being reminded uh, and teaching myself, uh, is that just because God is calling me and using me in, in, in great ways, that doesn't mean that people are just going to automatically love me and give me opportunities. Uh, so the third lesson is do your call for God, uh, not for others. And it's a lot easier said than done because even in ministry, you want to impress your senior pastor. You know, you're, you might do something for your, like, for somebody else, like, for the applause of someone. Like, maybe you're not, like, you know, trying to get worshipped or anything, but you're, like, you're pleasing people, and you're, and you're doing it for people. And so my life first that God's just had, and he's just reminds me of over and over and over again, is 2 Timothy 2.15. I love this verse so much. It says... Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so I had three life lessons, and I had three ministry lessons. My three life lessons, life isn't about me. God is about, God is able to do what I am not. And the third, all I need is Jesus. And then what he taught me for ministry, preparing for ministry, to follow God's call, not people's judgment, to not compare myself with others, and to do the call for God and not for other people. And in those lessons, God has given me a ding dong, (laughs) a failure, someone with not a big personality, someone that's easily forgotten. He gave me a new beginning. And God doesn't just like start over. But it's a new beginning that's in his strength. 
without my weakness, like 2 Corinthians 12.10 says, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And now you know my weaknesses. Now let me share with you what God is able to do with this weak dum-dum. So like I shared with you, um, God allowed me to build up a Bible college that, that grew to one of the largest affiliates at that time. God used me to teach at the Bible college um, where I still have students um, who are wanting me to teach. Uh, God's used me to save marriages. God has used me to prevent suicides. God's used me to disciple so many. God's used me to take over um, you know, a hurting youth group that, um, um, yeah, I uh, was really hurt <laughs> when I first took it. From It had six kids in it, uh, and, and it's grown to, to 60 fired up students, but, you know, things always change. But uh, God's used me to reach hundreds of high schoolers with the gospel. And this year, uh, God will be using me to reach thousands uh, in the high schools, uh, possibly might even, depending on one high school, be able to reach 10,000 students with the gospel this year in my hometown in Corona. And so that's, yeah, the gospel is going to reach like a lot of kids this year. And um, so like Paul said, I boast of my infirmities because the power of God rests upon me. Because I am weak, he is strong. And God took up my messed up life, full of failures and full of not good enough, and he gave me a new beginning. From a hurt high schooler that got a new beginning as a high school pastor. From a forgotten Bible college student to one running one. From one not being cool enough to having like too many friends. I, I can't keep, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a terrible friend to everybody. Just I can't, I, I can't keep up. And from girl problems to a new beginning with married and having kids. Um, from extreme public speaking issues to a new beginning to where I can speak in front of you guys and not run away. <laughs> you know, and when David sends me the text, hey, you know, text me when you get here. I didn't just run away and turn, and turn my car around. And, oh, no way. No, <laughs> um, so, but he gave me a new beginning in his strength to be able uh, to do that. And from a worldly drummer even. Uh, with a new beginning to, to drum and, and uh, give praise to God. And so where we have failed or not been good enough, God can give a new beginning, a fresh start. But it's not just a start over. It's a beginning in the power of God for where I'm weak, he is strong. And if you're like me today, uh, often forgotten, uh, rely on the power of God. And if you have a natural ability and a big personality or whatever, and doing the work is easy for you, uh, it might be even harder for you to rely on God, but you, but you need him. <laughs> and so that's my testimony. Uh, while my resume might, might have sound like a dream, uh, it felt like a nightmare. <laughs> and, and if God can use me, he can use you. God isn't looking for the most righteous, most good-looking, most fun, or most popular. He's looking for the willing so I'm, I stand here uh, before you today, not just because God restored me, but because he made me stronger in him. Where I failed, God succeeded. And in the middle was a new beginning. And so um, let's go ahead and uh, let's take our break. What time is it? Yeah, let's take our break now because um, I get to teach now. <laughs> <laughs> Leviticus 23, man. <laughs> All right, so let's take let's take our break, guys, and we'll be back. Um, is there a time that we should be back? You guys ready for Leviticus? Yeah. The most excited group about Leviticus ever. I love it so much. Um, all right, let's, let's, um, all right. So who knows, <laughs> who knows what today is? Today is what? Yeah, it, Feast of Trumpets today. It's a, a very special day in Israel and the Bible. Uh, today's the Feast of Trumpets, uh, Yom Teruah. Uh, 
which just means uh, the festival of trump trumpets, or maybe you heard Rosh Hashanah, which is the head of the year, which means like the beginning of the year. So this is in Israel for the Jews. This is a spiritual new year. So happy new year, everybody. Happy, happy new year. <laughs> <laughs> and because it's a spiritual new year, it is all about new beginnings. And so do you see the connection I made? Yeah. Right? Uh, cool. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> I connected the two. Uh, this holiday was meant to bring spiritual new beginnings to every one of God's followers. So let's go ahead and, how, you guys already there, 23? Yeah. Leviticus 23? All right, so let's go ahead and pray. God, we come before you, Lord. We thank you, God, for today. Lord, what today means, a, a new beginning, a new start. And Lord, for, uh, for each one of us here, man, we need new starts every morning. God, we thank you that your mercy is new every morning, and God, that we can, uh, that we can just uh, be refreshed in you. And so, God, we ask that you would be with us today as we study this holiday in your word. God, I pray that you would uh, use it, Lord, to refresh us and bring us closer to you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church. Okay. There is three things we're going to look at for this holiday. The first is going to be the timing of the feast. So the first thing we're going to look at is the timing of the feast. The second thing we're going to look at is the meaning of the feast. And the third is going to be how it is celebrated. So we're going to see three things today. The timing of the feast, the meaning of the feast, and three, how it is celebrated. So the first one, the timing of the feast, uh, God instituted holidays to be a certain time to do three things, to remind us of God's past faithfulness, two, to repent on the present situation, and three, to rejoice on God's future provision. So God instituted holy days, holidays, Holy, holy days. Yeah. Three. <laughs> love you guys so much already. Just met you guys. I love you guys. Uh, <laughs> to do three things. Uh, one, to remind us of God's past faithfulness, to repent on the present situation, and to rejoice in God's future provision. And so in Leviticus chapter 23, God sets up seven, which is the number of completion, times in the year for his people to be to remember, to repent, and to rejoice. And in fact, in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2, it says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. He says, These are my feasts. That that makes it important. <laughs> you know, that makes it special. God is wanting to share with his people seven special times in the year. One is Sabbath. Uh, it's on the seventh day of the week, and you know this. It's where they remember when God took a Sabbath. It is when they repent of sins that happened during the previous week, and it is when they rejoice with time off work. All right? You guys get to have a little Sabbath later on today after this. Uh, the other seven holy days were not weekly, but like a holiday, they come at a certain point in the year. The biblical year was split up into three sections. There was three holy days in the spring, and there's three holy days in the fall. In the spring is Passover, and that's a picture of and during the spring feast, by the way, is, uh, is a picture of the work of Christ and what he's, what he's done. The fall feast will be of end times. So it's kind of fun facts. Uh, so in the spring feast is the Passover, uh, which is a picture of Christ's death. Then three days after that feast, did you know that there was another holy day? It was the feast of first fruits. 
And we know what happens three days after Jesus died. He resurrected, and that was a fulfillment of that feast, first fruits. And then 50 days later, did you know that after first fruits was another holy day? It was the last holy day in, uh, in, in the springtime, and it is the first fruits of wheat or the day of Pentecost. And you'd be aware of that in Acts chapter 2, because 50 days later from Jesus' resurrection, the day of Pentecost took place. And so we see that the the death, resurrection, and the coming of the Holy Spirit was fulfilled in these holy days. And between spring and fall, if you didn't know this, is summer. (laughs) Whoa! (laughs) Oh! That one. That one. (laughs) I'm writing that one. And this is uh, the summer age um, uh, is a picture of the church age, uh, or the age of grace. It's a picture of the, the, the time that we're living in when, when God is reaching people that because of Jesus' death, resurrection, and now the power of the Holy Spirit using us, we are now sharing the gospel with people. Well, we're going to keep sharing the gospel until the fall feast, right? Uh, the fall feast is the first one in fall is today, the Feast of Trumpets which is a picture of the rapture, but is also a time of repentance. In the fall, there is also the next one, is the Day of Atonement, which is about the removal of sin, or the last two chapters of the Bible. I like that, uh, you know, in the Bible, the first two chapters have no sin, the last two chapters don't have sin, and the middle of it is God redeeming mankind. Uh, Then the last holy day, uh, the seventh holy day, is the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's my personal favorite one. And it's about the kingdom of God dwelling among us. It's when they remembered uh, God dwelling with them in the wilderness. And so I'm not a big numerology person at all. I think people take it way too far. But I do think it's kind of interesting how many times seven is used with these holy days. As we saw, there's seven holy days. Sabbath is, this, is on the seventh day. The sabbatical year was every seven years. Jubilee is to be observed every seven sabbatical years. And from the first feast in uh, spring, Passover, there's seven weeks until the last spring uh, feast, which is Pentecost. So seven weeks from Passover to Pentecost between the two. Uh, The last feast, which is in the fall tabernacles, lasts seven days. And the month with the most feast is Tishri, which is the seventh month in the year. Uh, And that is when trumpets, Day of Atonement, and tabernacles takes place. What does this mean? I don't know. (laughs) Just showing you. (laughs) Uh, Makes me think God is cool. (laughs) Makes me think God's cool and interesting, though. And, um, uh, but yeah, the Feast of Trumpets, though, lasts actually for 40 days. Actually lasts for 40 days, and it's already been happening, in a sense. Um, A month before the Feast of Trumpets actually hits, um, they begin their celebration, and it lasts for 10 days from, like, today. And so the 40 days was meant to be a a time to establish your walk with God. And Jesus did this. After Jesus uh, was baptized, what did he do? He was in the wilderness for 40 days, right? He was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, not allowing sin to have victory, choosing righteousness. So like the 40 days of trumpets, Jesus also established his walk with God. So if trumpets is about repentance, which it is, and the day of atonement is about the removal of sin, then what is the last feast about? It's about the kingdom of God, right? It's about the kingdom of God dwelling among us. So check this out. Right after Jesus the remover of our sins, spent 40 days in the wilderness. 
the very next words that come out of Jesus' mouth is seen in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Interesting choice of words. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And for those reasons, and for some more that we'll see later, some scholars believe that Jesus' baptism, the 40 days in the wilderness, and him saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, actually did happen during the actual Feast of Trumpets. Uh, because of the way it just perfectly lines up. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Yeah. where That's the next words right after he uh, comes out of the wilderness for, after 40 days. Um, so because they, they line up, they, some scholars actually believe that this did take place during this uh, Feast of Trumpets period of time. So now you're there at Leviticus 23 still, right? All right, look at verse 23. We'll get to some fun stuff pretty soon. Uh, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, which is Tishri, right? On the first day of the month, that's today, you will have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. That is today. It's kind of cool to read something in the Bible that's speaking about today, isn't it? Uh, Do you know what else happened today? Um, It's when Nehemiah 8.10 was said, which says, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to the Lord. Do not sorrow. This is when this verse was said, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Is that cool? Today is when Nehemiah, which is my son's name, Nehemiah 8.10 is like all over our house. So it was a cool day today to just look around and see it and be like, today was the day that Nehemiah 8.10 was spoken. Uh, So now, how about you turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 8. Let's look at, let's look at an actual, let's look at, you know, look into history, right, of what actually happened today. In the time of Nehemiah. So um, because Nehemiah 8.10 was said on today, that means that this was the day that Ezra read the Torah to the Israelites because they were hungry for the word of God. So let's just look at verse uh, 2. I want to read to verse 12 uh, if, you don't, uh, if you don't mind. So it says, uh, are you guys there? So Ezra, the priest, took, brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. There it is, right? If you're questioning me on it, there it is in the word of God. I like to back myself up with the word, so there it is. Then, then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand And their ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which he had made for the purpose. And beside him, at his right hand, I don't know why I did this to myself, stood Matthai, I don't know. Sorry, just just deal with me for a second. Shema, Aniah, Urijah, Helkiah, and Messiah. And at his left, Padiah, Mishael, Malachijah, Hashem, Hash, Badana, Badana, Banana, Zechariah, and Meshul. And my wife, she uh, she did. I did. I studied Greek and taught Greek, but my wife did Hebrew. So I just Hebrew. I I can't. Um, verse five. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. For he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord and great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, (laughs) while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Just what an example for us today, right? As they did today, so should we. And also, Jeshua, Bani, Shariabiah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatiah, 
Hodijah, Messiah, Kalida, Azariah, Joseph, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book and the law, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, uh, said to all the people, This is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those of whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our God today. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly, because they understood the wor words that were declared to them. So today, on this first of Tishri, Feast of Trumpets, are you hungry to know more of the word of God? And have you today made the joy of the Lord be your strength? Psalms 81, verse 1 through T, t 3, <laughs> tweet. Psalms 81, verse 1 through 3, tells us to celebrate today with joy. It says, sing aloud to God our strength. Make a joyful shout to the God of Jacob. Raise a song and strike the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the loop. Blow the trumpets at the time of the new moon, at the new moon on our solemn feast day. So today. So today is meant to be a day where we make a joyful shout to God, where we celebrate God, where we are excited for him and what he's done. And now one last thing in the Bible uh, may have happened today. Uh, the Jews would be upset with me because I said may have happened today, but they strongly believe that on this day, Abraham was told to sacrifice Isaac. Uh, they call it the Akedah, Akedah, you know, in the Hebrew, Akedah, or the binding of Isaac. Uh, what you have to know about the Jews <laughs> is that the way they see descendants uh, is different uh, than the way we see descendants. For us, like we carry the name, maybe the last name of our family, uh, and then our descendants are just people that, that were before us, that we came from, you know, their family, but we came from them. Jews, uh, they like think of themselves like they are like, like they are who they are. Are, like almost like Abraham is living on through them. They, they see like their descendants like as if that they are an extension of, Ab of Abraham. Like they're coming. From, that's why they kind of, you see in the New Testament, they just kind of apply Abraham's righteousness upon themselves. And then Jesus calls them out, you know, over and over again. But they, they keep thinking that they're righteous and good with God because of Abraham and Moses and you know, because they're from them, they think that they're uh, holy and righteous. Uh, and, and so because they believe Abraham's obedience, I'm sorry, uh, for the Jews, um, they thought that Abraham, that they were just living through, like Abraham was living through them. And because they believe Abraham's obedience to, to bind Isaac happened on this day, that they would receive blessings and promises that were given to Abraham, that because Abraham was declared righteous in Genesis 15, 6, that they are declared righteous as well. Um, what's interesting about that as a result is that the Jews believe that one day, um, I think I have a slide for that. Oh, look at you. No, you had it. You had it. Yeah, that's it. So the Jews uh, believe that one day the shofar will blow, the trumpet will blow, as a result of this belief, it's so crazy, um, then that they will be raised to meet the greater son of Isaac, which Messiah, and enjoy his presence forever. 
So that's what the Jews believe, which actually gives us insight to a verse that is often quoted as the prophetic fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. It's 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise, for it's not the Jews. <laughs> the dead in Christ, I mean, dead in Christ, the Jews will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So the shofar blast that the Jews are looking forward to prophetically is actually for us. <laughs> so we've gotten a big picture of the timing of the seven holy days. We saw that the Feast of Trumpets is today and that uh, the things that has happened on this day, like in Nehemiah's day. Lastly, I want to show you something uh, really cool about the feast. Uh, that is a picture of the last days and also of Jewish weddings. Uh, if I know Christians, Christians love end times and weddings. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so <laughs> this takes place. Uh, when the feast ends on its second day. So it'll go on to like tomorrow, sort of. Um, there's 10 days from the Feast of Trumpets. And the Feast of Trumpets prophetically is, of, is speaking towards what? The rapture, right? Okay, so there's 10 days from the Feast of Trumpets to the next feast. That is the Day of Atonement which speaks about the removal of sin, right? So you have rapture, 10 days, removal of sin. Now, in those 10 days and in the Jewish wedding, the groom comes for his bride like a thief in the night and takes her away for seven days. Now, also in celebrating this holy day, in between trumpets and the Day of Atonement is what they call the seven days of awe. And what you have to remember is the Feast of Trumpets goes on for like two days. So two days, and then there's seven days off. So like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? And it takes you to the ninth day. Does that make sense? Yeah, start over, redo. Okay, we'll just keep going. We'll just keep going. Um, so... There's seven days of all that end up leading to the ninth day is all I want you to know for right now. Uh, this is a picture of the seven years of tribulation when the bride of Christ is in heaven. And in the Jewish wedding, like you said, the bride comes and takes the bride like a thief in the night, and they stay together for seven days. And at the end of the seven days of all, it's the ninth day, um, and there's one day before it's that 10th day, right? That is the day of atonement, before it hits the day of atonement. There's like this one day. Is that a day of nothing? No. What happens? What ha I think this is so cool. Um, <laughs> what happens um, after the tribulation and before the removal of sin? Yes. And during a Jewish wedding... On that ninth day it would be a marriage supper where everyone comes together and they celebrate the wedding. But yeah, on the ninth day is a um, is a, is the marriage supper of the Lamb that is fulfilled. Um, and so, if you want to read more about that, Judges fourteen, Revelation nineteen, Genesis twenty nine, twenty two to twenty eight. Um, and then after the marriage supper of the Lamb is the tenth day, the Day of Atonement, and in the book of Revelation, we see that is when sin is actually removed. After the marriage supper of the Lamb, there's that thousand-year millennial kingdom and that reign of Christ, and then Satan comes back up, and then, boom, wiped out forever. Sin is forever gone, fulfilled in that day of atonement. And then, what's the next holy day after that? Is uh, tabernacles, right? Which is about the kingdom of God dwelling with us. So do you see how it's like 
comes together? Yes. I'm doing my job? Yes. yes. Ten days. So, okay, so it's uh, ten days between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement, but Feast of Trumpets lasts for two days. So you go, like, one, two, and then, like, add seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Ninth day. Ninth day is when the marriage supper of the Lamb would take, takes place, and then the tenth day is the actual Day of Atonement. Uh, so... Um, knowing that, you're going to appreciate another verse in the Bible a little more. Jesus said to Smyrna, the church in Smyrna, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, he said, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw you, throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until the end, and I will give you the crown of life. Um, and uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Revelation 2, 10. So you kind of see how the Feast of Trumpets really fulfills this uh, last day's um, prophetic uh, picture that God set up for us. And with the timing down and everything, it's just, to me, things like that just make the Word of God, like, I love it. You know, Word of God is just so cool. It's, it's a lot, though, huh? It's a lot of information, a lot to take in, but that's why I say, like, you got to, like, keep digging, and you find gold, especially with Leviticus. That's why I love Leviticus so much for that reason. Um, one more fun fact about the timing, and then I'll share about the meaning of it. The Jews also strongly believe that Moses went up on the Mount Sinai to receive the second set of tablets in between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Uh, and they believe that Moses came back with the tablets on the Day of Atonement. So, um, you know that now? I don't know. Is that true? I don't know. Jews strongly believe it. Uh, and again, I'm sharing information that um, is for the, during the time of Jesus when he was around. So, it's relevant in the fact of you know what the Jews were thinking and believing when Jesus was on ministry, you know? And so cultural context to your New Testament. Put it in your back pocket. You know, I might, might, you know, might read a verse in the New Testament and it really connects everything. So we just studied the timing of the feast. Next, I'm going to teach the meaning of the feast pretty quickly. Uh, and then I'll share with you how today is actually celebrated. Uh, so the second is the meaning of the feast. In short, repentance, preparing the heart, it, prophetic fulfillment, the, the rapture. In long, it is the day when the people of Israel examined their heart and made the necessary changes to make sure that the upcoming new year will be pleasing to God. Uh, in Jesus' day, the Jews thought that Rosh Hashanah was one of the four judgments. What four judgments? Good question. <laughs> I'll answer that one. Uh, there's four, they, they believe that there's four judgments that take place during the feast days. And it's actually all based in Deuteronomy chapter 11. So why don't you guys go ahead and look at that? Again, this is something that in Jesus' day the Jews believed. Um, so Deuteronomy chapter 11 Go ahead and turn there. Uh, and each judgment is expressed in agriculture. So let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 11 and let's look for some agriculture. There will be four. And they believe that the Feast of Trumpets takes place <clears throat> is one of these judgments. So you guys there? Deuteronomy 11, uh, and we're going to look at verse 13. Okay, you guys ready? Okay, cool. And it shall be 
that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, so here's what they're being judged on, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Then I will give you the rain, agriculture number one, for your land and its seasons, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain, there's the next agriculture, your new wine and your oil, and I will send grass, that's part of grain, in your fields for your livestock. There's the third judgment. Um, even some translations say um, um, your uh, flocks of sheep, that you may eat and be filled. Verse 16 says, Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Verse 17, lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you and he shut up the heavens so that, there, uh, so that there be no rain and that the land yield no produce and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. Last verse, therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your hearts and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. So this was no joke. The Jews took this very seriously. And um, because these different agricultures develop and came at different times in the seasons, they, ha they developed, uh, there's four judgments. And the first judgment is the grain that took place during Passover. The second was produce that took place during Pentecost. The third is livestock that took place during the Feast of Trumpets. And the fourth one is water. The fourth the judgment. So the, if the Israelites disobeyed God and they did not love him and they didn't serve him with all their heart and soul and mind, with all their soul, like it says in verse 13, then God would not bless them. Teaching them this, that there is no season where, God, where they don't need God. There's no season where you don't need God. And what a great lesson for us. There is no season where you don't need God. We easily, as humans, can default in being pretty entitled. God has gifted us with life, with air, with water, with food. We're just dust. Actually, even worse, we're disobedient dust. <laughs> God would still... Be God to look at us like the disobedient dust we are and say, well, no error for you. He'd still be God. Doesn't change anything about him because he even is still just in doing that. He's still just in his actions. He is still God. And so on your next dorm cleaning, go look for some dust. Start naming them. <laughs> Give them a plan. <laughs> and and maybe 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 call maybe call some to a specific purpose to reach and impact the other dusts. <laughs> and then maybe one dust you'll be like you're the Billy Graham dust. You're gonna reach all the other dust and you're gonna tell them about me. And then they start doing the I don't know stupid right. But then could you imagine this? Could you, they do the exact opposite of what you say? <laughs> and they still expect you to provide for them and give them their needs and their wants and all that. They're, and they're demanding it. You know, I, I would probably, I, I've been saying this as a dad a lot, uh, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. <laughs> I would just Lysol wipe them, you know, and gone. You know, but God gives us many chances. And we are dust, we are just, we are nothing compared to God. And, and yet we sometimes feel so entitled. <laughs> like, God, you still got to give me this. And you still, still got to bless me with this. No, there is no season when you don't need God. We need God always. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the first one was grain. Um, that uh, is the first judgment that takes place during the Passover. So if they were disobedient, 
during what, like January, March, you know, in that time, then God would judge them during Passover and, you know, they wouldn't be blessed with grain. Uh, the second would be uh, produce. Oh, the day of Pentecost. Um, takes place during the day of Pentecost. Uh, the third one is livestock or flocks of sheep, which is today, Rosh Hashanah. So if they were, if Israel were, was disobedient, not loving God during the summer, then yeah. Um, and then water for the Feast of Tabernacles, which water with tabernacles. I hope one day I get to teach you guys about tabernacles because that's my favorite one. It's so much in it. <sighs> Let's go. <laughs> this guy's like, everyone's like, Shh. <laughs> uh, God's given us many chances, though. Uh, yet, for Israel, uh, they were meant to be an example to the world of following God, to represent to the world that we need God, to show us what a relationship with God is like. That was Israel's purpose. However, Israel has a tendency, like us, to forget about God and yet still expect blessing. So when Israel would forget God, God would, would, would remind them by taking away things that they needed or wanted. And so this is true for us. God corrects the ones that he loves. It says in Hebrews 12, 2, 5 through 8, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you, <clears throat> but if you are without chastening, of which uh, all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So when Israel disobeyed in the summer, then it was judgment or correction in the fall which would be the Feast of Trumpets. And the correction would be the flocks of sheep. But all through the New Testament and the Old Testament, God's people are compared to as sheep, right? So that kind of changes things a little bit. because so God sees us as his sheepies, which changes the understanding of the judgment a little bit from where we would have thought that our disobedience or that their disobedience would lead to no sheep in the land, to where each sheep, us, them, are being judged. So there's two inscriptions that were found around the time of Jesus that give us some insight about this uh, and onto what the Jews thought of Rosh Hashanah during the time of Jesus. Uh, one of them, I have a quote here, says, On the new year, so today, happy new year, all the inhabitants of the world pass before him like flocks of sheep. <clears throat> As it is said, he has fashioned the hearts of them who understand this, all their doings. And so, what does it mean on the new year, sheep pass before God? Well, an ancient Jewish inscription also says this. Three books are opened on Rosh Hashanah today. One for the completely righteous, one for the completely wicked, and one for the average person. And again, this is Judaism. Like, this is just what Jews thought during the time of Jesus. This isn't like church, you know, Jesus. Um, just want to clarify. I just thought of it for a second. I was like, I hope no one's thinking that. I'm like, I'm like this is actually what's happening today. Um, but anyways, okay, so three books are written on Rosh Hashanah one for the completely righteous, one for the completely wicked, and one for the average persons. The completely righteous are inscribed in the book of life. The completely wicked are immediately inscribed in the book of death. The average persons are kept in suspension from Rosh Hashanah to the Day of Atonement. If they deserve well, they are inscribed in the book of life. If they do not deserve well, uh, they are inscribed in the book of death. So let's just take a moment. Thank Jesus. <laughs> Jesus gave us freedom from Judaism. Uh, however, there is some truth to what is said, uh, not during the Feast of Trumpets, but during the white, great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15, 
which I guess prophetically lines up with the Feast of Trumpets in the 10 days before the Day of Atonement. But on the Great White Throne Day, or Great White Throne Judgment, the wicked are blotted out of the Book of Life. And Psalm 69, verse 28 says, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. In Exodus 32, verse 32 to 33 says, Yet now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. So today is a day where they prepare themselves to get right before judgment. You see, obviously today was a very important day that them, Israel as sheep, are now being judged by God. And and in Leviticus, you read that each priest would examine the sheep for blemishes if they were clean or unclean. And so God is now doing that to the hearts of people. And he's looking at each one of his people, sheep, and he's judging them. And so they believe that on this day, God is judging them. Um, so today is the day where they prepared themselves to get right before judgment. <clears throat> In a different way, we can take advantage of the meaning of this feast. We can look to Jesus who took our judgment. John one twenty nine says, the, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is our Lamb that passed for us. And so that we don't have to, right, pass before God. Because if I pass before God and he looked at me, sinner, gone, blotted out. <laughs> I'm not good enough. But Jesus is good enough. He is the lamb. He took it for us. He is our lamb. And, but maybe you've been living in disobedience. Maybe you haven't been loving Jesus. Maybe you haven't been serving God with your heart, soul, and mind. Well, today is the day to be able to repent of that. Isaiah 58 verse 1 says, Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout out loud. Don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. Before that trumpet sounds, we should already be turning from our sins. And Jesus said in Matthew 24 verse 46, he said, if the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. And later on in that section, Jesus says that there's weeping and gnashing of the teeth to the servant that has not done a good job. And in Romans chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, it says, he will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and live lives of wickedness. So Jesus is our Savior from our sins. He is our Day of Atonement. He is our Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But not so that we continue in sin. Otherwise, he isn't really our savior because we didn't want to be saved in the first place. To those that realize that they need Jesus, they live a changed life. However, we fail and mess up and God gives us opportunity. And like Israel, sometimes in the busyness of life, we can forget to be led by God. And even doing just Christian work, godly work, pastoral work, you can do the work and you're not having Jesus in it with you. You're just autopiloting. You're going through it. But there's no point. You're chasing the wind until you've included Jesus in it, until Jesus is a part of it. And so this was the time to stop. Today is a day to stop to reevaluate your life, to regather the truth of what God wants us to do and apply it and do it and get it done and to get us ready for the next feast, the Day of Atonement. A good way to do this, right, is James 5, 16. Confess your trespasses to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. 
But what I love about this feast is that how it is celebrated shows us some practical ways to repent, ultimately for a new beginning. Shows us ways to have a new beginning, and I need to hurry it up, right? Yes. So how? The last thing we'll look at today. How the Feast of Trumpets was celebrated. So you have to know, if you haven't noticed already, that the Jews did not strictly only follow what the Bible said to do in celebrating the Holy Days. By the time it got to Jesus' day, every feast had undergone significant changes compared to the simplicity of the biblical foundation. Before you get upset with the Jews over that, um, let's remember we can complicate Scripture too. Jesus gave us simple commands. Love him, love others, preach the gospel, make disciples, remember him in communion. Yeah, we complicate it. Sharing the gospel, you know, we turn it into like, it's passing out tracks and inviting people to crusades and we got to have a band come and play. And like, those are fine, they're good, but like we're complicating sometimes what God just made simple. You can just go tell someone about Jesus in the grocery store, you know, loving him. You know, he says, just love him. But we, sometimes we complicate even just loving him into this system and this program. And, and maybe it's good that you have a structure in a relationship with God, but sometimes we can complicate our relationship with God. Just love him. Just love him. Do you love God and others? Love other people. Look after people. Make their needs above your own. Put them above yourself. Anyways, I can go on and on. Uh, we should just be careful not to complicate what God has already made simple. So before the day of the Feast of Trumpets started, in the synagogue, the shofar is sounded daily to alert the people that the time of repentance is near. So as it leads up, the shofar would sound, and just before the feast, Jewish men would take a special water immersion um, to symbolize cleansing their ways, where we get baptism from. And this may have been the time when Jesus was baptized by, baptized by John the Baptist. Uh, but of course, Jesus didn't need to repent <laughs> for this feast. Uh, but he did desire to prepare his heart before he began the ministry. And so on the first day of the Feast of Trumpets, the Israelites would grab, and I brought one with me from Israel, um, yeah, a li- it's, a, it's a little one, but it's just a little guy. But um, they would grab, and I tried to, like, learn how to do it, but the last couple times I did it, yeah. I, do, I'll, dude, I'm going to try, I'm gonna try, but I'm not going to. I fail, okay? <laughs> Can't do it. Yeah, I, it's, it's really hard. Like, once you get it, it's like this certain way, and it, and it works. And so on the first day of the, I was going to say I could pass it around now. I'm going to like, that's like passing around COVID. So I'll just, <laughs> here you go. You can look at it. I don't know. I'll set it right here. <sighs> Anyways, oh, so <laughs> they're, they're on to me. <laughs> So just before the feast, they would take a special immersion uh, bath, and then on the first day of the Feast of Trumpets, so today, the Israelites would grab a bent or curved shofar because it was to represent the turning of their sins. Ah, so that's why the bent. So, yeah, they can't do like a straight one because, you know, it has to apply the bending or the turning away from their sins. And so the very first thing that takes place during the Feast of Trumpets is that the trumpet is blown, which, uh, which ushers in a new era, a new beginning, uh, a new year. And so these shofar blasts ultimately for, are fulfilled by the rapture. And there's three key verses that show this instead of reading them, because we don't have time. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 58, and Revelation 4, 1 talk about how these shofar blasts ultimately fulfill the the rapture. And so with the shofar, they would make three blasts with the shofar, and they would have a sequence, and each 
of these three blasts actually have a meaning to it. The first one represented sovereignty, and it was called Malkyot, Malkyot. And this was a reference to the kingdom of God, which Jesus returned 40 days in the wilderness, and what did he shout? Remember? Revelation 4, or Matthew 4, 17. After, yeah, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That is what he was fulfilling in this exact uh, molt kyot, in this shout, this first trumpet blast. So I think it's cool that in this first trumpet blast was Jesus' very first trumpet blast to the world. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so that's what the first blast represented. The second one was remembrance. And this was an appeal to God to remember the covenant that he had with them. Um, and so it was a trumpet blast to almost like, hey, God, look at us. <laughs> look at me. Look at, um, and it reminds me of Exodus chapter 19, verse 19, when uh, God, just before God gave the Ten Commandments to the Israelites. In Revelation 19, 19, it says, and as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Mo Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder, which crazy. Um, they're, they're trying to get the attention of God. And they said, look at us, remember us. And so we are raising a trumpet, asking for God's attention. I think it's kind of cool to think that during Jesus's day, when they were blowing this trumpet, that the actual fulfillment of the covenant was walking right beside them. Jesus Emmanuel was with them. And so um, the third one, the third blast is just called a shofar. <laughs> fancy. Uh, and it was meant to be a memorial. So if you go back to Leviticus 23, verse 24, um, it says that the trumpet blast was meant to be a memorial, but it doesn't actually say of what. However, I do know this, that um, the only other time the shofar was blast in the Old Testament before this was in Exodus chapter 19, verse 19, that we just read when the Torah was given to Israel. Um, and so this was probably a, meant to be a memorial to remember that God has given the word of God to them today. So today was meant to be a day to be thankful that you have received the word of God. Um, I have a bunch of other times that the shofar was used in the Bible, but I don't think we got time. So, um, but I want to tell you. Real quick, real quick, real quick. Um, the second time the shofar was used was when Israel conquered uh, the battle at Jericho, Joshua 6.20. The third time was to give signals uh, to the assembly of Israel's about war, uh, 2 Samuel 20, verse 1. The fourth time was to warn Israel of danger in Amos 3.6, Jeremiah 6, one two. Um, and the fifth time was to signal the start of the Jubilee year, Leviticus 25, verse 9. And the sixth time was to remind Israel that God is mighty, uh, Psalms 47, verse 5, which another trumpet in the last days will give us that same reminder. And we read about it in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. It says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So that's on that last seventh trumpet. Then the next two times the shofar is used is mentioned prophetically, and it's when the shofar um, is in Zechariah 9, 14, when the Messiah arrives. And the last time that the shofar is used is the eighth time, which eight being the number of new beginnings, right? Um, is when uh, the great shofar will be blown to gather the Jews for the reign of God's kingdom in Isaiah 27, verse 13. And so the second thing that needs to happen during the Feast of uh, Trumpets is that all work must stop like it's a Sabbath. And so you guys are going to do that today, right? I, I did this, right? Uh, blew the trumpets. <laughs> and you guys, uh, and so we signaled the... Uh, the age of the Feast of Trumpets today. Now the next thing after this is do nothing. Don't work. Don't work. Reflect. Rejoice in God. Rejoice that you have the word of God. And think of what God's wanting to change and work into your life and do it and apply it. Then the third thing that the Israelites would do for the Feast of 
trumpets during the time of Jesus was they would give an offering to the Lord. Uh, it doesn't say what in Leviticus, but you can read about it in Numbers chapter 29, verse 1 through 2. The fourth thing they would do is in the traditional home, the evening uh, they'd have, so at evening time, so for your guys' dinner, they'd have a festival dinner with different uh, dishes that represented something, like they'd have fish that represents uh, the awareness of God and an opportunity to do good, pomegranates to celebrate new and unusual experiences. They have honey to, uh, that they add uh, in their food to remind them to have a good and sweet new year. There's some others too, but the fifth thing that they do during the Feast of Trumpets, during the time of Jesus, is they would go to synagogue for an evening service. And maybe you guys can do this together if you want. Um, later on today, they would read three sections of Scripture together. And they would read Genesis chapter 21, which is about when Isaac was born. And then they would read about, then they would read 1 Samuel, the second section of Scripture that they would read on this day in the evening, which is 1 Samuel 1 uh, to chapter 2, verse 10, when Hannah asks God for a son and dedicates her uh, son to God. And then the last section that they read in the evening time is Numbers 29, verse 1 through 6, which is about what God, uh, about what to offer God during the Feast of Trumpets. Yes. Uh, Numbers 29, verse 1 through 6. Uh, and then this would end day one. And then on day two, because there was two days, a good part of the day was really chill. Um, so I, I pray that your Feast of Trumpets day two is really chill. Um, and they would spend their day in music and in prayers with a the theme of re repentance. And this was a day, remember, to be joyful. And they would wish their family and friends a blessed new year. And they would be singing psalms to each other. Then in the afternoon, something kind of cool takes place. Uh, something called teish, teishlik, teishlik, or something, tashlik. Um, what it is is a lot cooler than it sounds. And it's one of the last things that they do before the Feast of Trumpets. And they spend some time at a body of water. Uh, ocean, lake, stream, bathtub, you know, whatever. They find a body of water. And it comes from Micah chapter 7, verse 19 where the prophet says, you will hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. And it says in 719, he will have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And so to illustrate this verse, people grab breadcrumbs uh, or pebbles in the water. Um, they grab something and they almost cast their sins into it, right? And they go, God, I repent of you know, whatever it is that you're trying to show me, and they throw it into whatever body of water it is. And then just before the Feast of Trumpets ends, they go to synagogue again, and they read another three sections of Scripture. The next one is Genesis 22, which is about Abraham binding Isaac, which now you know why. Then the second is Jeremiah 31, verse 2 to 20, which is a beautiful section of Scripture that is about God's salvation and Israel's repentance. And that's what I'm going to want to close with today. Um, the third verse that they... Read is, again, that same verse in Numbers 29, verse 1 through 6, that is about what to sacrifice to God during the Feast of Trumpets. Um, but I want to just read to you the last two verses of Jeremiah 31, what they would end the Feast of Trumpets with, and we'll end our class with this reading. It says, I turned away from God, but then I was sorry. I kicked myself for my stupidity. <laughs> There's my testimony. <laughs> I was thoroughly ashamed of all I did in my younger days. Here I am. But now look at verse 20. Is not Israel still my son, my darling child, says the Lord? I often have to punish him, but I still love him. That's why I long for him and surely will have mercy on him. And what a perfect verse. God is all about new beginnings. Today is a day to repent, to make things right so that we can receive the joy of the Lord. And so thank you guys for having me today. Um, uh, please spend some time today reflecting on the meaning of today to just stop for a moment and reflect and celebrate your opportunity to repent. And so may the joy of the Lord be your strength. Thanks for, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks. Cool.
Thank you guys so much. It was a blessing being here with other Bible nerds. And uh, we did Leviticus, huh? <laughs> 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 go, go rest. <laughs> Sabbath now. <laughs>